right. Thank you guys for waiting so patiently. I know everyone's hungry. I am, at least. Um, my name is Abir. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, in the States. Um, thank you in advance for sitting through my nervous, uh, shaky voice. My maternal grandmother, Sabha Oda, was from Yaffa, Palestine. Newly married with her first baby and another on the way, she was forcefully displaced from her home in 1948. She eventually resettled in Al Amadi refugee camp in what is now the West Bank. It's where she raised 14 children, became a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and where much of my family still resides. I only met her once in my life, but without a doubt, she was a major influence in my love for food. And she might not know that, so I decided to write her a letter about my food story and share it with you all today. Dear Siti, it's Abir. I know it's been a while since we talked, and when we did get to meet, I was your bratty three-year-old American grandchild who didn't talk much. I know when mom brought me to visit. Hmm, I don't know what happened. Sorry. Ooh. There we go. Got it. I know when mom brought me to visit you and all the family in Palestine, I survived on ice cream and sunflower seeds and insisted on living in my pajamas, as you can see. Mom said I'd whine and cry if anyone tried to make me do different and that you and CD would tell everyone to back off and do whatever to keep me happy. Mom says I waited till the last days of our trip to finally start opening up and talking. I didn't know it'd be the only time we'd have, but you've stayed with me all these years in another way and I'm writing this letter to let you know. So, Siti, I kind of have this little obsession with food and cooking. I always have, and I'm sure you saw it in me. My palate has come a long way from ice cream and sunflower seeds, though, and you can thank your daughter, Huda, for that. It wasn't easy for mom, being your only daughter, to make the long trip to America, where she would be met with new people, a new language she didn't speak, and grocery stores that didn't stock any of the ingredients she was used to seeing you cook with. But she got by, she was resilient, even though she was lonely, I know she felt like a piece of the family was there every time she cooked one of your recipes. Her food always made our house feel like a home. Despite all the difficulties you faced, you managed to make a refugee camp feel like home. And I can't help but think she got that from you. My earliest memories are running to the kitchen whenever mom was cooking something up. Even as early as four or five years old, she never shooed me away and would always make sure I had something delicious to devour when I got home from school. She'd let me help however I can, despite my age. I stood on stools or chairs to help stir the pot sometimes. My siblings capitalized on this love that I had for food. We'd play a restaurant, which was really a way for them to get me to make food for them. I played the waitress, the chef, but somehow I had a blast. When we had long drives and were cramped in the back seat, I'd turn and face them and put on my own imaginary cooking show for them. They entertained their baby sister's love for food and that support has never stopped. Mom let me watch a ridiculous amount of cooking shows on TV and back then they weren't easy to come by. So you could imagine why I wanted my own now. We all became fans of Jack Pepin and his non-foo-foo approach to French cooking. And we'd all laugh a little bit when he pronounced cookie sheet as cookie shit. We became introduced to Asian cooking through Martin Yan and always said his closing line along with him, if Yan can do it, so can you. I think a part of me felt at home watching them. They had accents like mom, they cooked the food they grew up eating, but weren't shy to introduce new ingredients or flavors. They were true to themselves. I know they were some of the first chefs to inspire me and later on I'd look to them for confidence in my roots and culture. But don't worry, Siti, mom cooked a lot of Palestinian food. She eventually found the right ethnic markets to go to for Middle Eastern ingredients, and when that didn't work, she found a way to improvise. But look, you can't plop a Palestinian immigrant into the south side of Chicago and not expect them to try something new. When we came home talking about how great Susan's dad's flautas were or how delicious some pasta was we had at a neighbor's house, mom took on that challenge to make, her foods, to make the food her kids loved. She wasn't gonna have anybody else do that. But even mom, Mm, sorry. So maybe it was Warek Diwali one night, or tacos the next. Even mom's added sushi and gyros to her favorite list of foods. 
She inspired me and showed me that I can have a deep love for my heritage, but that the places, people, and culture I grew up around were just as much a part of me and my food. And that sounds amazing, I'm sure, but it took a serious identity crisis to come to that. Siti, I knew at a young age I really wanted to share my love for food with others, but that wasn't always an easy dream to chase. Life happens, we had hard times, we had some harder times. Money, moving, being a brown child of immigrants in America, it wasn't easy. As much as I love my heritage, especially the food, I often felt embarrassed by it. Kids made fun of the Lebna sandwich my mom would pack me for lunch. I remember one of my friends hiding the stuffed grape leaves we were eating at my house in her napkin so no one would notice that she didn't want to try them. And let's not mention when mom would find fresh purslane on the side of a road or alley. I prayed one of my friends wouldn't see us picking what they thought were probably weeds. Fast forward a few years, and though I'm still madly passionate about food, I can't really envision myself being a figure in that world. I thought about culinary school or about working in a restaurant, but none of it was appealing. Also, I thought, who could teach me better than mom? The cooking shows all became the same, well scripted, nobody I can relate to. No one cooked the foods we did, and no one even looked remotely like me. I got excited when I discovered a PBS cooking show about Mexican food, but it was hosted by a white guy. <laughs> Something about it didn't seem right, but I didn't know how to express it at the time. So I went on, finished college, skipped culinary school, always kept cooking. When blogs started gaining popularity, I was enticed by the idea that anyone can start one and just share what they love. But when I started checking out the famous food blogs, I was instantly intimidated. I could never make a site like that or take photos like that. And how do you spell bandora ma'liya in English? How do you write a recipe for a dish you've never seen a recipe written for? You just made it enough times with your mom to know how, how it's done right. Needless to say, I bullied myself into not starting a blog for a very long time. When I finally did, I constantly felt a battle of how to make my food American or palatable to white people, if we're going to be real. I shied away from recipes that I thought people would think were weird. I thought, who would even know where to buy pomegranate molasses or za'atar? Why was I so afraid to share something that I was proud of? Little did I know, the food world had trends too. And when I started hearing customers at work ask me where the za'atar or rose water was with a confused look on their face, I knew they had a recipe that called for it. I was initially excited to see more of us in the food world, but when I started to see that the narrative was void of our stories, it didn't sit right. When I started hearing people call maftul or falafel Israeli, I felt hurt, I felt robbed. When I saw famous food magazines share their secret to tabula was to replace the parsley with kale, <laughs> I was mad. I felt the love and struggle that made our food rich and filling was just being erased. Why was I always meant to feel embarrassed by this food or that it wasn't good enough? Why were the kids who made fun of my Lebanon sandwich at school now in line at the halal cart asking for extra white sauce? Why was there suddenly money in foraging in Brooklyn, New York, when our mothers had been doing it for years? Why was it suddenly trendy and who decides this? Why weren't the immigrants that brought these foods over showcased or even a part of the narrative? That was the part that made me upset, but it was a motivation and blessing in disguise that I needed. So I decided really quickly, Siti, that if I didn't take ownership of my food, my culture, my history, I couldn't be mad when someone else did and profited off of it. Don't get me wrong, appropriation still makes me mad. But I knew I had to raise my voice and not wait for somebody else to ask my opinion. I went from searching for validation to validating myself. I went from begging for a seat at the table to being just fine pulling up a seat of my own and inviting others to join me. There was freedom I felt in unapologetically being myself that I never felt before. I started sharing more, posts about what was true. That embarrassment I had when mom picked grape leaves or purslane off the side of the road became a blog post that I had so many people respond to with similar stories that they had from their childhood. I abandoned the fear I had about putting twists on Palestinian dishes and started serving my creations at a supper club that was named after your daughter, Huda, Huda Supper Club. And when I made some dope new friends that were down to film a cooking show with me, I was nervous, but I was ready. We filmed an online mini-series called Habir's Day Off, featuring dishes like shawarma tacos and rose cardamom tres leches. 
It felt like I was inviting people into my kitchen to cook with me, and it felt like home. Um, I had a mom tell me how happy she was that her daughters had someone they could watch that looked like them and that they could look up to. Things started picking up. An article online talked about how I was fighting cultural appropriation through my food. And even though a friend warned me not to, I read the comments section. <laughs> there was lots of love. There was also comments about how I wore my hijab, because, of course, what I wear on my head somehow has to do with my food. Um, and there was lots of hate to sift through. There were people who said I shouldn't be trusted with a pressure cooker that I could make bombs in, while others said things that honestly are not worth repeating. Sometimes I wish people would just see me for the food. But that would be like asking people to be colorblind. The reality is that, like in many other parts of the world, people of color, those that belong to marginalized groups, sometimes don't feel they have a place in the food world either. In a time where we have people showing their ugliest side and dehumanizing others, it's more necessary than ever to use what we're passionate about as a vehicle for unity. It's about so much more than food now. And while I know I might make some racist people uncomfortable, if there's one little abiyat out there that I'm inspiring, it's all worth it. So, Siti, I got invited to this food conference in Ireland. <laughs> I know, I, uh, I thought the email was sent to the wrong address. Did you ever think you'd have a Palestinian Southside Chicagoan granddaughter talking about shawarma tacos all the way in Galway, Ireland? Either way, I'm running with it. I hope my voice doesn't shake when I ask the crowd to challenge the subtle racism in the food world. That when food from minority groups is fetishized to cater to gentrification and solely to profit off of, to not support it. That when the people who make the food at your favorite lunch spot are racially profiled or harassed, that you stand up for them. And I hope I can encourage them that when they need a recipe for biryani, they seek out the expertise of a South Asian chef and not Bon Appetit magazine. Jack Pepin once said that food is the simplest form of love we can share. I know firsthand the power that food has to connect people, not only to talk about the foods we all love and reduce them to hashtags, but to hear the stories that come with, to be a gateway to understanding, representation, and diversity to be a platform for those that haven't had one and to pass the mic. Siti, I'm on this journey to keep our story and our food alive, and I'm not going to give up. Thank you for passing that love on through our family despite all the odds that were stacked against you. Thank you for, sharing, er, for showing me the strong line of women I come from. Thanks for being there in every dish, batch of pickles, and recipes I develop with mom. I hope I can make you proud. Talk later. I love you. Abir. Thank you.